Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch. And uh, a post-lunch session is always challenging. Uh, however, we hope that uh, you remain excited. We have a very interesting session lined up. This will focus mostly on South Asia, South Asia's linkages to the rest of the region, and the implications of RCEP and other uh, trade integration arrangements that are being negotiated at this point of time. And uh, we have three very good speakers, very great scholars and themselves, and the chair, the chair of the session is uh, Dr. Amitendi Pali. So without further ado, I hand over the session to him, um, Dr. Pali. Thank you, Dipakko, and uh, we continue the discussion of uh, uh, economic integration issues in the region, uh, cross-region, intra-region, within regions, because we are looking at uh, matters in a very wide-ranging gamut of perspectives. And this particular session is devoted to South Asia's participation in Asian economic integration. And and institute and our specific interests in South Asia. We are looking forward to the discussions in particular uh, on not only India, but by what extent the non-Indian South Asian economies can play a role in the evolving model of regional cooperation and economic integration in Asia. So three excellent uh, presenters that we have lined up today. The first will be Mr. Sebastian Sais, a new economist from Trade and Competitiveness Global Practice in the World Bank Group, to be followed by a distinguished academic uh, from Bangladesh, Professor Selim Rayan. And finally, uh, Mr. Pranav Kumar, with years of experience from the industry looking at trade policy issues. So, may I uh, invite Sebastian Sais? <coughs> to speak on India in furthering regional connectivity and trade linkages. Uh, Sebastian, for you and for the rest of the panelists, uh, if, if you could kind of be within 15 to 17 minutes, then we can have uh, a good round of discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks so much for uh, inviting me to join uh, this uh, uh, workshop. And I'm very grateful for your hospitality. Uh, having said that, I have to wonder that I'm a Latin American, so I tend to talk a lot. Uh, so please uh, uh, make sure that I, I will keep myself to the 15 minutes. Uh, so I would like to basically talk a little bit uh, about the region and how India fits within the region and what is going on in, in, in India, which is, I think it is important to contextualize the discussion and to, to uh, say, well, on the basis of this context and what is going on domestically in India. Yeah relevance of our set or relevance of the regional integration framework. So let me start quickly by uh, acknowledging something that you are aware of already, that uh, South Asia is uh, a region that is growing very fast, and uh, it will remain growing very fast if it's expected. And the interesting thing as well is that the, um, the growth is expected. We, it is based on, on good macroeconomic fundamentals, so most likely uh, remain uh, a strong uh, uh, region for a while. And uh, for instance, we, we have seen, as you uh, can see in this chart, that the inflation rate is uh, relatively under control in the region and the inflation has been going down, which shows that the growth rate, the high growth rates, are not uh, being uh, putting pressure on, on, the, on, the, on the prices. Uh, this is the forecast for uh, the coming years. And, uh, Said, uh, as you can see, uh, the growth rate remains high, and it will be expected uh, that uh, the growth rate are going to be both uh, uh, drive by um, uh, investment as well as by export. So again, the, 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 the external sector export will be an important component of the, the perspective of growth. But this growth is taking place now in a more uncertain uh, global economy. And I would like basically to you know, mention some of the, of the impact that this more in the global economy may have on the region. The first thing to notice is that there is a break in the, the trend that uh, was uh, uh, taking place uh, before 2008, and this 
have been basically manifested in the in the more uh, more uh, I would say flat rules of trade. So on the one hand, we are saying you know, regional integration is important. You know, growth uh, export growth are expected to play a bigger role in terms of the growth of the region, but the global economy context seems to be a little bit more challenging for the region. Also, uh, you know, if you look at the region, ex except for India, in general, the, the, the rest of the economies have a very, uh, say, um, uh, not a very diversified uh, basket, uh, export basket, which uh, means that, um, you know, this is a, a challenge for, 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 the, for the countries of the region. And as well, I think that uh, in terms of India, it means that India has opportunities for growing uh, through uh, regional integration and we will go back to this in a few years. One of the challenges of the region is the low participation in global value chains. And you can see that uh, although Bangladesh uh, has a very high participation in global value chains in total export, uh, it's very much concentrated in one sector, whereas in the case of, of India, the global value chain participation is very small, but in a wider set of sectors, electronics, automobiles, uh, in addition to uh, mm. apparatus as well. So this shows again that uh, if we want to maintain this uh, uh, the role of exporting to the growth economy uh, and the, the, the growth of the economy, we need to look at ways to uh, uh, strengthen this role and foster this role. Uh, as you, it is well known, the, um, the, the, the integration of the global economy in the region remains slow, uh, low. So uh, again, this uh, increases the idea that there are opportunities that are not tapped by the, the region currently. And this is in general the situation in, in, in all the economies that uh, you can see in this, in this uh, chart. Um, and I, um, and I think that also this uh, shows that why, you know, this is a blessing in some way as well because of the, you know, less reliance on, on, on trade uh, in a more uncertain context, you know, means that you, you have a more diversified way on, on fostering growth for the moving forward. And this is also a good news and a bad news. So uh, there was a lot of concern with regard to the impact of uh, both uh, TP, uh, TTIP and TPP in the region, and now with the uh, you know uh, less urgent situation in TTIP and you know the likely I mean the fact that TPP will start uh, in November as was mentioned by Deborah, but not in with, but without the United States, it means that you know the the, the negative impact that would take place because of the TP, TPP no longer going to be materialized necessarily. But at the same time, this shows that it is necessary to have a strategy towards these kind of developments for the future. And we have an opportunity to develop this, this strategy. But if you look at the composition of trade and trade partners in the region, and we look at India in particular, you see that uh, the United States remains one of the most important partners. And among the five uh, important uh, partners, China is the, the main important uh, the, 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 the Asia Pacific region. So it shows as well that for India, there is opportunity to grow there uh, and diversify its partnership uh, with other countries in the region. And we were going to go back to that in the, in the near future. So I, I just have some additional uh, figures with regard to the, the current situation, but I wanted to. I love as well that what is the how India's trade policy looks like more broadly. So if you look at uh, in terms of tariff rates, India has you know moved forward very very intensively and very fast. And um, uh, these are simple average apply rates, um, and it's about uh, 10 percent in the latest figures that we have from from the WTO. Uh, we, when we waited for for, tra for for trade, you know the the, the and it shows that two things. One is that the, the share of trade in total GDP has grown systematically, although in the latest year it has remained a little bit flat. And that the share of, of uh, uh, India in, uh, in, in 
world exports has one uh, up, but it remains relatively small, again, showing that there is a lot of space for improvement. In terms of services policies, India, uh, curiously enough, remains a relatively uh, restricted uh, economy, although I would say that maybe this, this data is uh, a little bit uh, out of date because um, uh, in the last two years uh, there have been a lot of reforms in India which have affected the, the, the investment regime, in particular in the service sector. So most likely when uh, this data is updated, this one from February 2017, most likely when this data is updated, uh, we are going to have much more interesting results. Also, this figure is very interesting, and we can see that the, off, the efforts that India is doing, both in terms of reform, the natural reforms as well, um, uh, reform that is directed with trade, and India has improved significantly its uh, indicate uh, its uh, level of performance in the logistics uh, sector, and uh, compared to 2014, which was the latest uh, data, uh, last issue, uh, last rank. Uh, in 2015, India was ranked 54, and uh, in 2016, the latest data that is available, uh, it ranked 35. And one of the most uh, important improvements took place in border management, which is dealt with uh, trade facilitation. I think that also it's very important to highlight the fact that when we look <coughs> at these developments in, in India, they need to be understood, understood in the wider context and the government. In the last few years, the Prime Minister of India has done a lot of uh, reforms which are, uh, are, in uni are mainly unilateral reforms, both an investment regime, ease of doing business, introduction of GST, etc., which really will change, I would say, we are, we are expecting that it will change significantly the performance of the, of the Indian economy and, and the role that the Indian economy will play in the near future in the region. So India, as discussed today, has you know a relatively active uh, regional engagement from so uh, different levels, and um, in that regard, I think that um, uh, the question is, and looking forward, is whether this arrangement will represent the direction that the Indian economy is taking forward. And I think that in that regard, there is a question mark whether the model that we have followed so far in India is the model that is looking what in India would, um, would look like as an economy in, in the near future, and I think that this is uh, something that policymakers need to look at. And I, I, I would like to um, elaborate a little bit more on that, but in the interest of time, I think that uh, I just want to uh, focus on, on the way forward. So India is moving towards uh, more uh, open economy, significant uh, reforms have taken place in the last two, two and a half years, as I was mentioning. Um, and we see that this is taking place in a context where the global economy is much more uncertain. So how, how, do, we, how do we move forward? What are the you know, policy options that are available in terms of regional integration? Of course, the focus today has been on RCEP, but I don't want to go into RCEP because I think we have a very interesting uh, session this morning. But I would say that from, the, from my view, there are at least two uh, important pillars in, a, in any strategy. The first one is that it needs competitiveness at the, at the domestic level needs to be improved significantly. There's, there are still a lot of challenges in terms of domestic infrastructure and implementation of, of, of uh, a lot of reforms. But at the same time, if you look at the, the trade uh, partners, the, part, the trade partners in, in that, uh, that India has, it is relatively concentrated, and there is a lot of scope not only to diversify towards the Asia Pacific region, which is a natural region where India could um, um, uh, diversify its, uh, its both its uh, um, export basket, but at the same time the, the, the number of partners that are uh, trading with India. But also Latin America is a region that I think that uh, India has not uh, taken advantage of and has not been looking at uh, significantly. If we compare, for instance, that with China, China has become for many uh, many developing uh, countries in Latin America the main trading partner. And, uh, and I think that uh, in that regard, uh, India is uh, maybe missing as well an opportunity. As I, as I mentioned at the, at the 
of the union, so I think you look at the trade requirements, five more important trade requirements for, for, for India. In the region, China remains the most important, although China, uh, India has a trade, uh, has trade agreement with several ASEAN countries, Japan, and we were wondering exactly why this, this agreement has not uh, provided the jump that uh, uh, India would uh, require in order to diversify its, its, its partnerships, uh, both in terms of the basket, the export basket, and, and, and the trade department. Last but not least, I think that you know, in the context of an uncertain uh, global economy, it is very important that um, India look for more for trade agreements in a way that they become uh, insurance policy. I think that I, I, in that regard, I, I think I have a different view from my my economist colleagues, um, which always look at agreements in terms of the, uh, the, the short-term economic benefits, in terms of new trade opportunities or traction of investment. But in fact, uh, on the basis of my own experience of trade negotiator and, and, um, and policy maker in my country, um, I think that the most important role that uh, trade agreements play are uh, is the insurance policy that provides terms of stability of rules and, and uh, enforcement of rules. And I can give you a couple of examples. For instance, when we negotiated uh, an agreement, bilateral agreement between Canada and Chile, one of the uh, provisions that we was included was to eliminate anti-dumping duties on, on the bilateral trade. And when the United States tried, uh, the United States adopted anti-dumping duties against the Chilean salmon. Of course, Canadian salmon producers were very tempted to say, well, you know, the U.S. is adopting anti-dumping duties against Chile on salmon, we should do the same. And, you know, they couldn't do it because the trade agreement for it is basically the, uh, the, the adoption of anti-dumping duties. And I think that this is exactly the kind of thing that we are looking at, the kind of examples that we are trying to bring to the private sector. And this, in this regard, brings me back to my question on the importance of whether the trade agreements that have been negotiated by, by, by India really reflects the interests of the country in the future. And, and maybe I think that there is a point for looking for more sophisticated agreements. And with this point, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. And uh, the second presenter. This is Sally Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I also thank the organizers for inviting me to this very important event. Uh, this is going to be different from the other presentation in the sense that uh, this presentation is looking at more from a non-Indian perspective, uh, South Asia's greater integration with Asia. So uh, the outline of my presentation is that, very briefly, I will talk about uh, South Asia's regional integration and then the South Asia region of greater integration in Asia, concerns in RCEP, because that is the main focus point now for other South Asian countries, some scenario analysis using a global general global model and policy implications. We all know that uh, we started uh, SARC in 1985, uh, and then SAFTA, the preferential trading arrangement, uh, and uh, SAFTA, those were put in place, and SAFTA is now uh, kind of, uh, uh, it was, should have been completed by 2016 with uh, uh, all members that are uh, giving preference or cutting down the tariff to 0 to 5 percent. And then there are uh, three bilateral FTAs within South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, India, Bhutan, and Pakistan, Sri Lanka. But actually the experience so far in South Asia, and that also came out in the morning session, uh, that the rigid integration, the delivery of SAFTA is not that great. Still, we are stuck with uh, uh, low infringement trade at 5%. And as well as uh, the 
the integration initiatives under SARC or SAFTA, they are not really moving first, or it's some kind of deadlock. So the recent initiative, uh, I would say that the sub-regional one, the BBIM, Bangladesh, Port India, Nepal, that has got some momentum, especially with, res with respect to the BBI motor vehicle agreement. And that has kind of, uh, now I, uh, we can see there are some developments uh, in this sub-regional grouping. As well as there are areas where uh, energy cooperation and uh, uh, trade facilitation, I can see there is something, uh, some activities are happening here. So, what are the problems? Uh, presence of the long sensitive list is, uh, is the, the country started beginning with the very long sensitive list, MTNs and MTBs. The difference, I think, we have talked a bit in the earlier session. Lack of trade facilitation. Uh, political relations between countries and some process are certain, as I mentioned, sub regional initiative is getting importance. And also, uh, though the countries they agreed on uh, signed an agreement on the civil services liberalization, but that has not really, uh, we haven't seen much progress there. So, like trade, we can also see that inter regional FTA is also very low, it's not around 5%. So from a non-Indian and foreign economy perspective, I guess there are two problems. Uh, the problems from the both sides. One would be like, you know, uh, I can see that there's a lack of kind of consistent leadership from India uh, to move the regional integration agenda forward. Uh, in some cases, India has shown strong leadership role, especially giving uh, duty-free quota free market access to LDCs or taking some initiatives. But in some cases, we can see some hesitant role. So that's why I mentioned it's a kind of not, uh, uh, not really consistent leadership. So that's not just simply blaming India, but we have to blame ourselves too. Uh, the other South Asian countries, their roles are not very clear too. This morning, we heard uh, uh, from one Pakistan voice about the kind of deadlock in South Asia and uh, kind of uh, putting much uh, blame to India, but I think Pakistan is also not giving India the different status. Uh, that that is also a kind of deadlock in, in this uh, in this regional integration initiative. Also, I would say that among the other South Asian countries, uh, probably Bangladesh has gone far to get the benefit from integration with the region, especially Bangladesh's uh, domestic policy and industrial strategies which promoted export and linked with the global value chain. Uh, those, of, those of us can mention about uh, that it's very concentrated about uh, centered on relevant governments. But despite that, Bangladesh has been very successful in being linked with the global value chain. And uh, sourcing raw materials from the region, especially uh, from India. So uh, Bangladesh's industrialization process uh, was benefited from integrating with India, importing quite a lot from India. If we look at other South Asian countries, Nepal and Bhutan, they failed because their import and export with India actually did not really lead much to their industrialization process. Sri Lanka probably next to Bangladesh, they, uh, Sri Lanka has also benefited. But what I'm saying that it's not simply the decisions which are undertaken at the regional level is important. Uh, what domestic policies and industrial strategy we undertake at the country level is uh, uh, equally important. So in that context, many of the South Asian countries they actually fail uh, to uh, you know, offer uh, what they can do at the regional level. So South Asia's greater integration in Asia, I can see there are three uh, categories of initiatives. First is where India and some other countries, South Asian countries are involved. So BIMSTEC is of course there, and then China's Belt and Road Initiative, especially BCI and EC. Uh, so where Bangladesh and India, they are involved, BCI and Economic Corridor. The second category is where any other South Asian countries involved apart from India. So the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and Sri Lanka's FT initiatives with China, Singapore, and some other countries. Now the problem with the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is that, uh, since it's a bilateral level, there are issues whether that can really generate benefit for at the multilateral or for some other countries can also get involved. So that's the second. But the third one, where only India is involved, India's FT with ASEAN, 
India's bilateral rescue with Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia. And then comes the Arsene. Uh, and that, that is something uh, which is getting more prominence, more importance, and especially because of the fact that Arsene's coverage, uh, around 45% of world population, around 40% 40 percent of world GDP, 30 uh, percent of uh, 35 percent of trade. So that that shows that how big that initiative is. And there are, I can see, three major concerns for other South Asian countries when it comes to RCEP. First uh, is that exclusion of other South Asian countries, especially in terms of trade, loss in preference, because. Uh, some of the LBC in South Asian countries, they enjoy preference in the Indian market and Chinese market. And there is a risk of loss in preferences. Growing standards, we, talk, we heard about non-tariff measures and non-tariff barriers. But actually other South Asian countries, they look at ourselves from the perspective that this can lead to growing standards which already are the demand for really higher standards, which can have significant implications for Exports of other Spanish countries. Now, the political economy issue is probably beyond all these two, uh, the first two. It's more of the feeling of exclusion. You know, whether you get uh, uh, the emphasis of or you get uh, the uh, importance of getting more integrated in South Asia and taking South Asia as a whole uh, to be integrated with East Asia, Southeast Asia, or you just being excluded uh, and then only India participates. So what we did, uh, did some scenario analysis using the global general global model, cheetah model. I'm not really get, getting into the nitty gritty of this model. It is a comparative static model, and it has got a, uses a global uh, database, and actually it used, uh, I have used the very latest one, which is available, version 9 of the database. Now let's have a look at the scenarios. So what I did, I ran five scenarios. The first one is the RCEP FTA, which is kind of proposed now. The RCEP countries, they uh, have the free trade agreement. Then the second scenario is the extended RCEP FTA. So what I call extended RCEP FTA that all other South Asian countries, they also join in the FTA. Then the third one, now in the second, second one, so, uh, since uh, the, the problem of this, the extended RCEP FTA is that the South Asian countries, they are themselves are not that integrated and we can see a deadlock, especially the political issues. So what are the other alternatives which can happen? One thing would be RCEP, RCEP uh, BBI and FTA, taking BBI and countries into RCEP. Or another would be probably more plausible is that uh, RCEP BIMSTEC one, because BIMSTEC, under BIMSTEC, Sri Lanka is also there, apart from four BBI countries. And then, uh, the final scenario, I looked into uh, the scenario of growing standards. So what I did that RCEP FTA plus rising standards in the RCEP countries, which may lead to some high transition cost in trade for the other South Asian countries where they want to export to uh, the RCEP countries. The scenario actually uh, include RCEP FTA plus 10% rise in transition cost uh, on the exports from other South Asian countries to RCEP. So now let's have a look at the results. So I just I'm just presenting the results in terms of personal change in real GDP. So the RCEP FT actually that brings a gain for all RCEP countries: uh, ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, South Korea, India. I'm not really getting into the details why some countries are getting more uh, benefit than others. But look at the other South Asian countries. In fact, all they uh, would experience loss in terms of real GDP. Nepal has the highest uh, number you can see. And so the South Asia as a whole, South Asian GDP as a whole, would increase by 0.5%. Can I, can I just uh, screen it directly, please? Uh, and then, but when you consider the South Asia excluding India, uh, the GDP, actually, their whole South Asian excluding India GDP declines by 0.4%. So the next one, the extended RCEP, where other South Asian countries also join RCEP, and you can see the actually all South Asian countries gain. And interestingly, the RCEP countries also their magnitude of gain increases. So uh, 
and then as South Asia as a whole, their gain becomes larger, and South Asia, excluding India, their GDP also increases by close to almost 1%. Then ask the BBIN, actually they are added where you can see that the BBIN countries they gain in addition to the RCEP countries. RCEP, Beanstech, FTA, where the Beanstech, Beanstech countries also gain, including Sri Lanka, uh, they also gain and uh, the magnitude of gains are quite significant. And where the RCEP, FTA plus standards, that means the position of uh, transition cost on exports from uh, other South Asian countries to RCEP countries, and you can see the magnitude of loss for other South Asian countries would be very, very high compared to their simple RCEP FTA scenario. So what we learned? So policy implication is that, okay, in general, uh, for the, uh, from the perspective of the other South Asian countries, the external RCEP scenario would certainly lead to meaningful integration of South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. So uh, if that is not possible, then probably the Second best option should be RCEP, BIMSTEC or RCEP, PBIN. So the, the proposal is that the other South Asian countries should also negotiate for their participation in the RCEP. And in that context, the role of India is very important. Uh, whether how India takes that leadership role within South Asia, as well as taking other South Asian countries uh, to, uh, you know, for their participation in the RCEP. But at the same time, what I was mentioning at the beginning, the role of other countries in South Asia is also very important. In terms of addressing the political issues, especially linking market, growth investment and policy, uh, uh, drivers of uh, integration, how they are interlinked, uh, different political drivers are very important, primary and secondary institutions, structural factors. I'm not really getting into the details, I have a paper on that, but those are interesting, I can share with later. And then of course the extra regional drivers, outside drivers like different donor agencies and the role of other countries also very important. But at the same time, at the very last point, I'd like to mention that the importance of domestic policy in industrial studies are very important. Especially in these countries where actually I agree with Sebastian as well, when he was mentioning that whatever happens, India has to undertake its own liberation policies. That is in the context of India. But in the context of other South Asian countries, they have to have reforms in their own economies and also they have to link their economic policies with the regional integration policies so that, that can, they can really benefit from, their, uh, from these initiatives. Uh, especially when, you, when I look at the industrial issues, apart from Bangladesh and South Asia, all other South Asian countries are actually experiencing a uh, declining share of their manufacturing GDP, it's a kind of deep distraction process which happens to be very, very other. With this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much, Mr. Chief. So the third speaker on the panel, Mr. Pranath Kumar. Then two years down the line, 
the situation will be entirely different. Exactly one year when we came for the previous uh, ISS workshop, at that time we were discussing TDP, now TDP is gone away. And that is for industry, for factories, it is very difficult to adjust to the fast changing global trading regime, and that is really unfortunate part. And since uh, uh, last 20 30 years, we have been trying to stabilize the global trading regime, address uh, those who are doing business, those who are practitioners, they face a uh, certain and predictable economic and global economic environment. But that is not happening. And over the last one year, we have seen that uh, uh, there has been a very dramatic shift and change in the global trading environment. And, and, and my presentation is coming from that uh, the angle that how Asia, South Asia and, and the three region which have been, three sub region which have been mentioned in the title of the workshop, South Asia, South East Asia and Asia, Asia Pacific basically, respond to the, 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 the challenges and try to work towards greater economic integration. Because if you look at the three major continents, uh, Asia, uh, Europe and America. Europe, we all know, is a very successful example of economic integration. America also, if you see the intra-American trade, it's very high. Only in case of Asia, the intra-Asia trade is not very high in comparison to other two continents. Uh, Africa, of course, is a different uh, dynamic which works in Africa. Uh, and over the last one year, you see that America first Brexit uh, have given a lot of uncertainty in that market. There is a rising clamor for protectionism. The whole discourse around deep, deep globalization, which we are discussing currently. And if you look at the global trade alert report 2006, 81% of the protectionist measures in 2000 were by G20 countries. And FTAs anyway, in spite of the fact that we are going at the city agreement and it's a universal phenomenon. And lastly, the more important uh, uh, factor is that is, of course, global value chain. And that is the key uh, factor which helps in the integration. If we uh, call that the European Union is the most successful example of economic integration, that's because of the value chain they have created. That's because of the, it's not only the, the, they have a common tariff wall, but of course, the, the key factor in that integration is the movement of people, the kind of regional infrastructure they have created. So that is what we have to learn and we are lacking in the Asian region. And second uh, important uh, aspect which we all have to understand, if you look at the dependence of major and not only major, even smaller Asian economies on these two markets, America and uh, Europe, USA and Europe particularly, the heavy dependence in spite of the slowdown and all the, the, the demand slowdown in that market. So, Two markets are still, is still very important for this region. But the kind of uncertainty and uh, the problems uh, we are facing you know, at the political level or otherwise in that market, that is of course not good for the businesses to grow. In fact, if you ask Indian industry view, so we have been talking a lot about uh, uh, locus policy and activist policy, there is a high level of uh, political trust and push from the, our leadership that we have to integrate with the uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia, but if you ask, frankly speaking, industry view, they are still very much obsessed with the European and American market. Because if you look at our uh, trade, which export, which is going to EU and Europe, that is almost 35 to 40 percent of our entire exports going to these two regions. So for them, it's important, but of course, there are challenges which are, of course, uh, uh, emerging in those markets. So that, of course, uh, uh, compels you to think about alternative and alternative is of course the Asian integration and that is extremely important. Not only from the point of view of ASEAN in South Asian economy, but if you look at all countries, China, Japan, India, Korea, Indonesia, all these are major economies and their dependence on the these two markets. So and all these countries are going to face a problem in the future in terms of the market access and the kind of political environment which are emerging in the these two major on this. Now look at the US and EU, which are part of the top five destination countries for exports for all these countries that we have seen in the previous slide. 
as regards Japan, total service export 24.6 percent go to US and 16.8 percent to EU. So for Japan, EU uh, FTA is important. Uh, at the same time, TPP not happening against the setback for Japan, and that's why Japan was very keen to uh, raise the ambition level in RCEP. Uh, 25 percent of all service exports from Singapore also go to these two regions. Uh, even for India, also Europe and America, these are two major uh, uh, destinations for services exports. Uh, even the possibility of increased protectionism in these two countries is cause of concern as uh, it creates a vacuum in international aid. And lastly, there is also a gap in the levels of integration with DVCs based on levels of development and domestic capacity. This determines how well they will cope so protectionism might rise solidly in the West. So, answer to this uh, emerging scenario, of course, we have to, uh, because there are many institutional mechanisms which we are developing already. Morning, we have been uh, discussing. Our, we have discussed our there are many bilateral FTAs which are in operation in South Asia. We are going for some regional initiatives like New State, BBI, and all. But all these, uh, uh, how we can make use of these emerging institutional architectures to build a robust regional supply chain. And that is very important. When we talk about regional supply chain, of course, uh, the traditional way of trade is, of course, not going to. Work, uh, and that is what we have to understand, and and, and that is what we have been asked particularly. particularly. When you, if you only focus on tariffs, if you only focus on service, if you only focus on business, well, that will not take you too far. Even in case of India, if I give you the example of India, we have a big trust on making in India to attract investment. But some of the feedback which we are receiving from uh, our potential investing countries, like uh, and this has been a part of my many joint economic grouping, which bilateral joint economic group and most of the feedback and concerns which have been raised by our potential investor that since we have a fairly open investment regime but your trade cap but your trade barriers are relatively high and that is it. because no investor is going to locate entire production to a particular destination. They will operate on the value chain. Part of the production network will come to you but part will go to Thailand, China and the neighboring countries other. And they will try to see how they can source and assimilate at one place. So for that, of course, open investment regime is important, but at the same time, tariff budget has to be low, good trade facilitation infrastructure, standard compliance. So it's a kind of complete ecosystem which you have to create. And then, and in that case, that will help you to uh, create a supply chain or help you to integrate into global value chain. And that applies to all countries because this is a model which is emerging and that whether it's a LDC or developing country or developed country, it applies to all. The good part is that uh, though a lot of uh, uh, focus has shifted toward Asia and Asia Pacific, and and this is a, again I call it kind of a new battleground for not only for the countries who are actually here, but of course for the countries who are outside this region also, and this region. In spite of the global slowdown, has not been affected as much as the, as the Western countries. And so that's the kind of opportunity for us to work and see how the connectivity issues, uh, uh, how the trade barriers that issue we can overcome, and particularly trade facilitation and all. And we can see how we can achieve, and more importantly, the standards, particularly. And the standards is we have been discussing, and that is going to play a major role. Uh, and as I mentioned in the morning also, you get preference on tariffs, but there is no preference on the standards. So standard compliance is must. Uh, and when we talk about standards, let's not try to uh, equate standards with that non-tariff barriers. And we have to take the standards in a more uh, positive way because this is one thing which is going to stay. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a information gap or capacity gap. And that is how we are trying to uh, work with Indian industry because 10 years back there were also there were a lot of uh, uh, complain and giving about that the standards are too high. We are not able. We are a smaller country. We are a, a small industry, so we, we are developing a country. We won't be able to comply with the standards. But now we have a big program which we are running with the Department of Commerce and all the standards setting bodies of India. I mean, then participated in one of them also, and we have taken a very forward-looking approach that if you have to with a relevant player in the global market, if you have to integrate in the global value chain, then there is no escape route. You have to comply with the standards. So, 
and, and of course on the standards we are not going to get any uh, trade difference. And, and more important, the, the, the hard reality is that majority of developing countries, they are standard takers, they are not the standard givers. So you have to uh, comply with those standards. And when we talk about the value chain, particularly global value chain, the other element which is very important is the private standards. The lead companies sitting in Japan or Germany, wherever, they have their own set of standards and smaller companies have to comply with that. So that is again a very hard reality. If you are able to comply with the standard you are in, otherwise you are out. Now coming to the uh, uh, data integration. So, since morning we have been discussing about uh, ASEAN Plus and ASEAN, we have a very good discussion on ASEAN uh, and in fact I was present in the last round of negotiation in Hyderabad also and uh, of course things are, uh, at least there is a high level of political will, political commitment and I said that uh, since TPP has gone, TDIP is again it's in the problem because of the developments in Europe and America. So ASEP is a big hope, not only for the countries who are participating, for, but for the global, uh, all other countries as well, because that will at least keep the sentiment high that okay, some countries, some leading countries, if you take the ASEP at Japan, Korea, India, China, they are the big economies of the world, and most of the growth are taking place in this region. So if ASEP happens, that will have a big, big uh, psychological boost for the global economy and other players also. So again, I will not uh, touch upon this, this again. Uh, this also we have uh, discussed since morning after with a kind of response to the noodle ball phenomenon. And uh, this is again uh, Asia Pacific again. Uh, uh, let me just conclude the, my presentation. So, so within Asia, we need to find ways to increase our dependence, uh, we must be found to reduce the dependence of the economy on one or two large markets. So that's why Asian integration is a big uh, continent. We have to uh, increase our interdependence within Asia rather than depending upon two big markets of the world. Uh, energizing global value chains and regional value chains through FT is one way to do this. And regional integration can have positive effects for building capacity and reduce uh, stocks of policy shifts in other markets by the cohesive trading community. Like this. Lastly, I would mention about uh, the whole services issue, and that's why since uh, we are talking, we are the theme of my paper and presented how we can reduce our dependence on two major markets. And Indian services sector is a classic example. We are dependent on one sector and we are dependent on one or two markets. So high export concentration issue, high market concentration issue. And that's why in India we are trying to see how we can diversify our exports. And when we come to talk about this region. Asian region, particularly some of the countries which are very uh, uh, good uh, uh, tourist attraction like Thailand, India, um, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and all. So we can really think upon some of the traditional sectors where we can increase our economic engagement and partnership to people, people's uh, uh, connection and offer tourist flow because if we are able to develop more uh, uh, on, for instance, the tourism, for the education, for health, these are very important sectors from the employment point, point of view also because these three sectors particularly create huge impact on the informal sector employment and this region has a huge potential to cooperate uh, along with this. Thank you very much, Pranav. So, three different but uh, rigorous and insightful presentations. Let me now uh, invite questions for participants and audience. So, uh, like the usual pattern that we have followed in the earlier panel, maybe we can uh, gather a bunch of questions. So, Dr. Dupayu Mukherjee, Sanchita Basu, and I see so this is a third question and then such so we'll have these three this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. My question or uh, clarification from Professor Salim Rehan. Um, 
I liked your presentation and the simulation study that you've done. I was just wondering uh, what kind of liberalization you may have used, and in that context, would you assume that the other, if the other South Asian countries were to be in RCEP, they would have any different reservations other than what India already has in, in going in for those liberalizations, and what specifically would those be? Uh, you may concentrate on Bangladesh specifically, or Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, if you want. Thank you. Bangladesh probably is the only country out of 
duty free quota free access that India provided, we have more terrifying succumb. We have gone right up to 97 percent for, uh, for for Bangladesh, while others are confined to 87 percent. So, so, so that uh, advantage is, is something which uh, uh, do you see as a possibility in terms of strengthening the, the rest of South Asia and, and, and uh, uh, getting uh, anchored? And, and with your commitment now of Bangladesh to Belt and Road Initiative, uh, when it comes to RCEP, you say that India should play a role. Uh, what do you think about China? Would China play a role to bring Bangladesh into RCEP? Thank you. I think that's a fairly exhaustive uh, round of questions for the first round, and I'll come back to Ganesh and Dr. Fo in the second round after uh, the, the, the speakers have progressed. Okay, uh, hello, hello, Dr. Fo. Wait, wait, wait. Second round. I said second round. Wait. So please, Salim. Uh, I start with uh, Professor Shachin's uh, comment. Uh, actually, the presentation was, uh, uh, I was asked to give a, give a non-Indian perspective, a non-Chinese perspective. So I agree with you. It's actually, uh, the role is not for India, but uh, leaders of the RCEP initiatives, they should actually uh, consider and they should take the lead. India, we mentioned because India is in South Asia, so and when you talk about other South Asian countries, probably the responsibility is more for India. When you talked about the scenarios, uh, actually, it shows that uh, under the, uh, that relates to uh, your question about it's simply FTA, simple FTA, just tariff revision, no sensitive list, just some all tariff cover across all sectors, zero, bringing down to zero. Uh, I, uh, we can make things complicated bringing in the sensitive list, but I thought that just for comparison, take the full liberation scenario, um, uh, the bilateral tariff among the RCEP, the member countries. So here actually the under RCEP FTA, the, all the South Asian countries, excluding India, they would experience loss. Uh, but that loss can be minimized or if you can, they can gain if they can join uh, in, the, in the RCEP framework. Uh, whether they should join uh, incrementally, for example, if we take Bangladesh as the case, uh, that's, that again, I would say, another difficult thing for countries like Bangladesh. Uh, so, when I was uh, mentioning that other South Asian countries, they also have to take initiatives. One of the major problems of them is that they have the lack of capacities in terms of trade negotiation. So, for Bangladesh, I think, Bangladesh uh, initiated to have some bilateral FT discussion with Malaysia, not with China, but that did not succeed. Actually, whatever FTA, uh, bilateral FTA negotiation, Bangladesh started the negotiation, uh, none of them actually materialized. The recent one is with Sri Lanka, but we are not still sure whether that would be materialized. So the problem is that maybe one of the reasons is Bangladesh is an LBC. The incentive is to enjoy the preference as, as long as you can. So that is the kind of quality economic factor is there. But I think uh, if there is a kind of regional initiative taking other countries, then, then in that case there will be peer pressure. And I think the countries like Bangladesh should also be very, very impressed to enjoy uh, or participate in this kind of broad uh, uh, mega trading bubble. Uh, my final point, what Professor Shachin also mentioned that, I think that was very important. Even if you don't join, what the other South Asian countries can do. Uh, in any case, they, are, they have the risk of loss in preference and rise in standards. But here comes the role of the investment. So if other, the RCEP countries can come in South Asia, not just India, other South Asian countries, invest, then I think that the value chain uh, mixtures uh, or that network can actually be strengthened. For example, Bangladesh has opened up now and uh, particularly setting up a special economic zone for Japan, for China, for India. I think that these, these initiatives can actually really be very helpful for strengthening the global value participation of Bangladesh global value. But I've not seen probably some initiatives from Sri Lanka is there, uh, but not other countries uh, in South Asia. My uh, question to you for very about the standards. Uh, I think there are two or three very uh, uh, clear uh, uh, steps which we are taking. We 
You mentioned about uh, for instance the country specific standards like the EU and Japan. Of course, that approach India is also following because some of the EU is an important market. And for instance, whenever there is any change in EU, the capital sector is a good example, they are rich and then we encourage our capital sector to make themselves compliant with the rich regulations. Similarly, in marriage products also. So, still, if you uh, take the case of India, the US and EU, and when the TTP was being negotiated, we were the impression that US standards will prevail uh, in all the TTP countries, and in, and in that case, Japan uh, and other countries in the Pacific region. Uh, of course, they are also an important trading partner. So, when the TTP was launched and negotiated, at that time, we went closer to US also in terms of government of India signing MOU with the USA on, the, on cooperation on the standards. With EU, we have a long standing cooperation agreement. And there are many projects which EU is funding, the European Commission is funding, to do the gap analysis and how we can help Indians to come closer to the EU standards across several products, not only one or two. Uh, so, of course, that, uh, on the one hand, we are trying to make our standard regime in compliance with. The, uh, international standard. At the same time, we are also seeing how we can apply and harmonize the standard with the key markets of the world. Third important initiative which we have taken, and we have from industry side, the recommendation has gone that when we talk about the standard, it's mainly voluntary. So, so how we can make the standards mandatory through technical regulations, and that's a clear recommendation has gone from industry side to government. As a result of that, BIS Act was the Bureau of Indian Standard Act was also amended. And currently, uh, the number of products uh, which are under technical regulation that has increased to 137. And we are trying to put pressure on government that we bring more and more products under technical regulation. So standards won't be a problem. The standards you can uh, copy from anywhere without the standards. It's mainly the how many are under mandatory regulation how, and how we ensure the conformity assessment. Those uh, steps uh, are more important for us. Second, last point of the compliance to standards and particularly how we are helping the uh, uh, Indian industry. That also we have to uh, just cover a lot of ground on that because uh, still there has been a lot of uh, uh, gaps between government understanding and what industry demands. So that, that area is still, we have to do a lot of work. Thank you. So, I'm um, sorry I have to go through my uh, slides very quickly, but uh, except for Nepal, uh, for the rest of the South Asia, uh, the main trade partners are mainly developed countries. Uh, Sri Lanka, for Sri Lanka, the third larger part, uh, export destination is India. For Nepal, India is the first and the most important. And for Pakistan and Bangladesh, basically, India is not among the uh, five the more important. Department. Having said that, I think that there is a point in your, your which is correct on what you said that I think it's misleading because of the characteristic uh, of, the, of the region to look at the total trade, uh, the importance of re intra regional trade within the total trade. I think that most important is to look at the importance of trade with neighboring states in the case of uh, uh, South Asia, so for instance, Bangladesh, how important it is for. Western Canada and how important it is with Northeast countries and you know for for Sri Lanka as well uh, how important it is with, with more more closer Tamil uh, Nadu or or Bangladesh I think that the, taking the total is is very specific I agree with you. okay so the next round of questions now Anish Dr Wu and then Nadi. Sebastian, firstly, from one of your slides, it was a bit of a puzzle. Uh, the data for Sri Lanka showed that Sri Lanka was heavily in value chains in footwear. Do you really mean textiles, garments, and footwear rather than footwear? So I wonder if you can clarify. Second point, on another slide you had that India made a great success with unilateral liberalization. Are you saying that regional FTAs have no role in India's trade strategy? Can you clarify? Um, Salim, um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit 
the auto model? Are you doing utilization of tariffs as well as trade cost reduction, or is there something else in the model? Uh, secondly, your results. Um, so you had insiders gain outsiders lose, right? Which is the standard thing we find in CG type work. Anything else that you've done, found from there? Anything that's a puzzle? The Nepal number losing the small countries typically lose from these agreements, right? And are the biggest gainers if you, you know, have a uh, thing which has a lot of trade costs in it. So I'm just curious about that result. Is it because your trade cost numbers are very big, and therefore you don't get much gains from Nepal? If you, if you use 10% or something, you might get a much bigger number. Um, the overall number is a bit small, you know, puzzle. I've seen different types of things. So now, okay, uh, is it then that we shouldn't bother with being stick and so on? And again, that intuitively makes sense to me. It's been India plus some other small countries, etc. Gains are very small, why put the things going on for ages? We have limited negotiation resources. I wonder if you can justify it in political economy terms. The small numbers, I understand, come from the model, and again, depends what you assume in it and so on. Uh, for Pranav, CII has always been some sort of uh, model for a lot of the associations in South Asia. Right? Because you have full capacity, you've been around a long time. What kinds of lessons can you draw for some of the smaller chambers? I'm thinking of Sri Lanka, Ceylon Chamber, things like that. In terms of the services, chambers used to be lobbying bodies. Is there something more that you should do or others should do following you? Thank you. Well, is a particular question. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna Dr. Bo. Uh, I have only uh, one question to Pranav and Anselim. Uh, for Anselim, uh, already, uh, someone already asked, uh, from your presentation, uh, they definitely the, uh, the investment of India in ASEAN and ASEAN can have a huge uh, trade and investment diversion effect on non members. Right? And then at the same time, the GDP can have a uh, very negative impact. So one of the uh, key policy question is that uh, you can list money in the measure to minimize the uh, negative impact, the trade diversion, investment diversion effect. But what do you think what's the best? You, you, you said investment, but investment diversion, uh, maybe connectivity, but limited resources, so like Sri Lanka, Nepal, was a priority policy uh, the best to deal with that. Question to Prana. Uh, I, 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 I am a little bit doubt about, uh, you say, FDA, right, enhanced value change. Because uh, on one hand, FDA can enhance uh, value change. So, but many uh, things in FDS can you know, uh, prevent the uh, lower value chain to be better. We don't probably see in the trade numbers and the uh, number of uh, member, members of FDI. So, what do you think, what kind of quality we don't probably see in our others? So, FDI is really can enhance the lower value chain. Thanks. I have a question for Mr. Kumar. Are Indian firms themselves starting to build their own regional value change with them at the center? And is that shaping how India is approaching our set negotiations? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Jayasri Puriyalad from Uni Asia Pacific, uh, Global Trade Union Federation. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation from the panelists. Uh, well, um, I have one question. Of course, it's connected to the, uh, the whole South Asia. I think Pranab uh, brought up a point uh, about the uh, movement of people uh, into the areas of tourism. And uh, of course, we are now discussing our value chains. And now, within uh, some countries, if you state the connectivity, None of the countries, they have, many of them don't have enough direct flights from their one capital to the other. So, we are talking of trade, trade related activities. Somebody should take the ownership. I think uh, Sachin mentioned in the morning, you know, with all the disputes within 
the political circles, the business community in China and India, they are smoothly progressing with their activities. So, my question to you, I mean, how, if you want to revive some activities and make the trade beneficial to all, so having maybe won't be uh, daily uh, flights, at least a flight twice a week or so from one capital to the other, and that might make things, you know, visa problems are uh, at, uh, we have, we know the difficulties, so that might be, so that as a SARC body, these are basic things. So if we can move on that direction, it might help. I would like to know your response. Thank you. I can't see any further questions as of now, so between them there are a handful. So maybe Sebastian, Salim, Pranav in that order. Yes, uh, just very briefly on, on the first question with regard to uh, Sri Lanka, which is why it's basically the final hour. Uh, on the role of the RTA, that you know, requires a longer answer in my view. But uh, I think that unilateral liberalizations, RTAs, and like that, play different roles. And what you see is that uh, because of many cases where India has, uh, if you look at has bilateral agreements, but you look at the, the importance of those trading partners, uh, they remain relatively small. So which shows that something is, is missing in, uh, in the relationship. But uh, uh, you know, I think at the same time that there are there is a lack of very strong rigorous analytical work on exactly the bilateral agreements. I think that uh, this is something that uh, requires further research. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think very important questions and. Uh, some clarification from my side on the liberation of tariff. Uh, first four scenarios only tariff, but the last scenario I brought in the transition cost. Uh, the trade cost. Uh, the trade cost, the bilateral trade cost or transition cost in the GTEP model actually, uh, variable we use that uh, to shock on the very particular parameter. Uh, now, whether the aggregate size is small or uh, probably the region as a whole it may appear small, but for the individual countries, we can see that some countries actually would experience larger loss or gain, uh, depending on their integration uh, with, the, with the region or depending on their trade with other countries. Now here I presented only the well, change in real GDP, but if we look at the export data, export figures, the impacts are much larger than what uh, we see for the real GDP. So, so that is one explanation. Second explanation is that this is also a, a kind of a comparative static one result. So the dynamic one uh, could be the results could be uh, or the impact could be much larger, which uh, the kind of in a comparative static framework may not be able to capture. Uh, the other question was on uh, the investment and uh, trade. Uh, Actually, now the, uh, whether you can join our service, be a mega trading blog or whether you cannot, it's not just uh, your choice. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, there are whole political economy issues there, how things uh, uh, move in, especially when there was the TPP was very much on the agenda. Bangladesh got really scared because uh, Vietnam is Bangladesh's competitor and then uh, now they are a bit of relief, I don't know, because when you were saying they are not. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see all the whole, uh, these kind of uh, political issues, but I, I, I could really see the policy makers. Even the, our commerce minister, he also in an open meeting that he said, he said we are kind of relieved. Uh, because they think that Vietnam is going to take a, a significant part of their market in the US, USA. So it's not your choice, it's not our choice, I think. But what we can do, the, uh, the kind of instruments we have, whether, as I was mentioning, that if we could play with that investment trade nexus, and uh, the kind of uh, initiatives or the kind of uh, environment you have, we can create within the economy, that's what we have the control on our economy. Because if we could invite investment from these leading RCEP countries, that could minimize some of the risk. Bangladesh has been able to do it to some extent, as I said about this establishment of the special economic zone. Uh, but uh, I've never seen these things in other, uh, much in other research. 
Thank you. So, let me first uh, uh, answer the uh, Dennis question that is uh, very fundamental for challenging. The role of industry chamber, in fact, uh, that often it becomes very challenging when members come and tell you that you will just speak out of us. So, you listen more to us than to the other parties. And particularly in the context of uh, international policy in the national trade, when the certain situation which are not in your control, you are given certain scenario where you have to respond. And that is very important for industry to understand, and that is what challenge for us to make industry understand. The larger foreign policy goes of the government, the larger strategy goes of the government. And due to two instances, one of course, when the RCEP negotiation, the government of India decided to join the RCEP. In the very first consultation, our members asked the government, very pointed question, Look, RCEP is ASEAN plus 6. With ASEAN, we have free trade agreement. With Japan, we have free trade agreement. With Korea, we have with Australia and New Zealand, we are negotiating. That leaves only China. And we never wanted FTA with China because of the huge trade deficit. So, why we are going for RCEP? Then, with government, and through us, we have to make industry understand. Look, we have to see the larger goal, larger picture, foreign policy, and all some of the countries who have taken the initiative like Japan, which is again important partner for us in terms of attracting investment and all. So it's a tough job to make industry understand about the particularly international scenario, international strategy goals. Second important thing about in Indian context, for the last 10 years, particularly post crisis, India is sitting on all the high tables of the world. E20 or WTO, World Bank, IMF, BRICS, and all. So when you are sitting on all high tables of the world, you are a global leader trying to solve the global problem. So there is a price of global leadership. And that again industry has to understand. For instance, if India granted duty free direct preference to LDCs, that was the price you paid for global leadership. If India granted uh, duty free access to all the South Asian LDCs, that's a very ambitious. Only 25 products are out, out in the negative places. That's all. When they have given duty free access to country like Bangladesh, which has a very competitive textile sector, Bangladesh export is 32 or 34 billion. Our export tex our textile is only 60 million, half of Bangladesh. But in spite of the fact we have given duty free market access to Bangladesh, huge resistance came from industry, but we have to make that industry understand. Okay, we have to think the larger business of it and all. So it is a very challenging task, but we have to do it. And that, of course, is a kind of learning for other chambers in the region. So, particularly making them understand about the global uh, region that they are working. Uh, second, you asked about the uh, FBI and if I understood your question currently, uh, FBI and global value chain. Uh, so, basically, Again, it's an emerging uh, scenario. If you look not only for trade, for investment also. And if you look at the current trade, uh, uh, almost 60% of the global trade currently is happening within the biology. So if you are in, then you are major trade player also. If you are out, you are outside the, out of the global trade also. And same applies to FBI also, foreign trade investment. You have to, if you want investment to come, you have to create an environment where at least you are, you are, you are helping companies to connect with the value chain and supply chain. And all the in every environment, every policy we have to take into consideration. That's why you have seen there are many countries, for example, Africa. They are very open investment region, but investments are not going because of the other factors. And I have a comment just on the uh, in our GDP, the rule of origin. The only under the GDP, uh, the rule of origin is a fully accumulated because there's more time to promote uh, value active created by the So if you import something, you add the value added. Take into account that.
Last week, this would be a few questions. What was that? Or whether Indian firms are developing their own regional. Okay, 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 I know. Good. So again, I would say India is not very well uh, integrated in the value chain. Except few sectors, you can say like automobile. But in case of automobile, also like uh, all the major global brands, they have huge investment in India because India is a big market. But the, uh, but the small players, SMEs who are supplying and they are uh, auto component manufacturers, they are supplying to uh, all the global giants, like Honda or BMW, or only for the Indian market. They are not the global supplier. So that again is a challenge because they are not able to match those standards, which makes you the global supplier. If Honda is manufacturing car in United States, for that they are, the Indian component manufacturers are not supplying. So you have if you are able to improve your standard, then only you become a tier one supplier. Then you supply to the for the global market. So so that's again a challenge for us. We are not uh, very well integrated in the value. We have uh, 10 minutes left for the session, so if there are any further questions. Okay. Thank you for the panel for an excellent presentation. And I just want to follow up with our uh, uh, points about the uh, industry have understand the general uh, purpose of the RCEP. For example, you talk about the example of China and India, where they have no FTA, so why it make any sense to you? India move on to RCEP. So, so my question is that I'm curious about uh, uh, what, what eventually happened. I mean, was the government response to that because of the want to be a global leader? Or, and also another question is about um, from your perspective, what do you think of the future of the India's trade relation with China? Because that's one of the key issues in RCEP negotiation and also that's been very important for the shaping of the uh, global uh, Norm in the sense of the size of those countries, so pressure points on that to matter. Thanks. So, uh, Hank, I suspect I can't see any further questions. So, what I'll now do is that I add a couple of questions from my side. <laughs> I wouldn't have done so had I not had the luxury of the few minutes that your very disciplined presentations and responses are given. So, my questions are to uh, Salim and Prana, respectively. So what I wanted to check is that uh, much as I think uh, I, I'm absolutely confident in the estimates and simulations that I've that put out. You know, let me uh, join Ganesh in taking this a little forward and trying to check. Is, I mean, was there any surprise in this results in the sense that if the RCEP comes up and there is a talk of a trade diversion effect with respect to countries, that have very strong trade relations with India and other members of the ASEAN. Uh, was there any surprise? I mean, do you, do you find the results surprising or expected? And the bigger point is that I suppose regional trade agreements will have to live with this. That there will be diversions created for others and there will be economic benefits. The jury is not yet totally out on whether they actually divert or don't or create. But I, I just thought I'd take you final view on this thing. Pranav, uh, what I wanted to check with you is that uh, there's absolutely no doubt about the fact that industry is probably the principal stakeholder when it comes to FTAs, or it should be, because industry is the user of FTAs. When uh, the last round of negotiations concluded at Hyderabad, there were a variety of press reports which reflected opinions from India industry, all of which was singularly negative in the sense that if this RCEP comes through, we are going to get smashed as we have kept on getting smashed and obviously you know who the concern was to be addressed. Now the point that I'm trying to make over here is that as uh, an industry chamber, you have this extremely difficult and totally unenviable job of trying to balance between both constituencies. One is your core constituency of industry members trying to assuage their concerns that FDAs are important and yet trying to send a signal to the government that I'm trying to do the impossible you know, by, by getting some converted from a group of totally unconvertible stakeholders. So 
how, how effective do you think that chambers like CII have actually been in this respect in taking the FTA engagement board in India? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it is a surprise, but uh, I can relate, I can explain why things happen. For example, uh, what you ran the uh, TPP scenario, actually that shows that Bangladesh is going to have substantial, some significant amount of loss compared to the RCEP one. The original TPP, original TPP, but uh, not the TPP lab, yes, original TPP. Uh, because the major concern was Bangladesh exports uh, in terms of billions to USA and then the major competitor is Vietnam. Uh, so compared to RCEP, actually you can see that RCEP, in the case of RCEP, that magnitude of Bangladesh's loss is much, is, is small, even if it's around 0.4% of GDP. Uh, but when it comes for Nepal, actually the story is just the reverse. The story is that Nepal is going to experience you know, in the figures of 3 to 3%, 3 at least in the case of uh, RCEP FTA. And it can go in, uh, to uh, uh, as much as 6% of GDP if that uh, non tariff issues are being added to the transaction cost, the minor transaction cost. So I don't know whether it's a surprise, but actually, actually I think that uh, rather than just looking at the, reserve, uh, the region as a whole, uh, the country level for Nepal, actually 2 to 3 percent loss in GDP is substantial. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's why I thought that probably this concept should be. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, uh, the two points uh, which you raised, I think the, the point about global leadership and, uh, and uh, India's engagement in RCEP, I think they are two different things. In RCEP, uh, uh, that was, of course, the industry response very objective and very pointed based on the scenario. But uh, since for any country, and for most of the countries globally, free trade agreement, FTA, has become an important foreign policy. These days, diplomacy is more based on the economic country diplomacy than the political diplomacy. So political diplomacy is important, but that is, again, mainly in the context of neighborhood and all. But for the uh, in the larger context, the economic and trade diplomacy have taken over the political diplomacy. So when this architecture was presented to India, I said, there was no way India could have afforded to sit outside. And that is what we were trying to make industry understand. And when and unfortunate part is that most of the time industry is combined only with tariff and trading goods. Because all these elements are comprehensive. It's not only trading goods. Trade services, investment flow. There are many countries in the world who they have used FTS to attract investment. So, so those are the uh, those channels we have not explored so far. And when it comes to the industry response on any FTA, forget about the RCEP and all. For any FTA, you say, uh, even to, today we go ahead with, uh, and negotiate FTA with any uh, smaller country. Also, industry will come and uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so most of the time, it's, uh, it is just uh, those uh, noises which you hear in the media, they are not based on very informed uh, debate and discussion. The best part of industry that they first you block it and then later you will see. And that's why and some of the approaches are very uh, uh, casual. For instance, Indian steel sector, they demanded that entire chapter to be put on the negative list. So chapter 72 that constitutes four military lines. I said this is not going to happen. And this is exactly what people want also. Because you may be facing problems in 40, 50, 60 tariff lines. So you give those tariff lines with proper justification, government will listen to your demands and maybe out of 30, 60, 30, 40 lines will go into the negative list. But if you ask 400 tariff lines to go in, that is not going to happen. So it clearly proves that they are coming with recommendations not based on not very uh, proper homework. So, so that's the again, it's the unfortunate part and uh, that should be proved. So the short point is that you need nerves of iron and steel to ensure that steel doesn't get onto a negative list. <laughs> At least the whole chapter. 
So, well, on that note, it's been a very spirited, very enlightening, and greatly uh, sort of informative session. Thank you so much to all participants. I think uh, Liana has some functions to